loves. Happy Wednesday. Today we are going to read Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Written by Judy Barrett and drawn by Ron Barrett. And going with the theme of the week, one of my most favorites to listen to when I was a kid. I used to want to live in the land of chew and swallow and have mashed potatoes come in as clouds. It used to be like my dream as a child. So I hope you love it. Um, it is different than the movie. So if you haven't heard the book, it's very, very different than the movie. It's just to give you a heads up. Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. We were all sitting around the big kitchen table. It was Sunday morning, pancake morning. Mom was squeezing oranges for juice. Henry and I were betting on how many pancakes we could each eat. And Grandpa was doing the flipping. Pancakes sound so delicious. This book's going to make me hungry. Seconds later, something flew across the... Th something flew through the air toward the kitchen ceiling and landed right on Henry. After we realized that the flying object was only a pancake, we all laughed, even Grandpa. Breakfast continued quite uneventfully. All the other pancakes landed in the pan, and all of them were eaten, even the one that landed on Henry. That night, touched off by... The big pancake incident at breakfast, Grandpa told us the best tall tale bedtime story he'd ever told. And a tall tale is a story that is not necessarily true. It stretches the truth. So this was Grandpa's story. Across an ocean, over lots of huge bumpy mountains, and across three hot deserts and one smaller ocean, there lay the tiny town of Chew and Swallow. And Chew and Swallow is one word, not three. At least in this book, it's one word. In most ways, it was much like any other tiny town. It had a main street lined with stores, houses with trees and gardens around them, a schoolhouse, about 300 people, and some assorted cats and dogs. But there were no food stores in the town of Chew and Swallow. They didn't need any. The, su the sky supplied all the food they could possibly want. The only thing that was really different about Chew and Swallow was its weather. It came three times a day at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Everything that everyone ate came from the sky. Whatever the weather served, that was what they ate. But it never rained rain, it never snowed snow, and it never blew just wind. It rained things like soup and juice, and it snowed mashed potatoes and green peas. And sometimes the wind blew in stores of hamburgers. The people could watch the weather report on television in the morning, and they would even hear a prediction for the next day's food. When the townspeople went outside, they carried their cups, plates, knives, and napkins with them. That way, they could always be prepared for any kind of weather. If there were, le if there were leftovers, and there usually were, the people took them home and put them in the refrigerators in case they got hungry between meals. The menu varied. By the time they woke up in the morning, breakfast was coming down. After a brief shower of orange juice, low clouds of sunny side up eggs moved in, followed by pieces of toast. Butter and jelly sprinkled down for the toast, and most of the time it rained milk afterwards. For lunch one day, Frankfurters, hot dogs, already in their rolls, blew in from the northwest at about five miles an hour. 
There were mustard clouds nearby, and then the wind shifted to the east and brought in baked beans, and a drizzle of soda finished off the meal. And even though this looks like a restaurant, they're not making any food. They just took the roof off so that when the food came, people could catch it on their plates. Dinner one night consisted of lamb chops becoming heavy at times with the occasional ketchup. Periods of peas and baked potatoes were followed by gradual clearing with a wonderful jello setting in the west. The sanitation department of Chew and Swallow had a rather unusual job for a sanitation department. It had to remove the food that fell on houses and sidewalks and lawns. The workers cleaned things up after every meal and fed all the dogs and cats. Then they emptied some of it into the surrounding oceans for the fish and turtles and whales to eat. Not a good idea, but it's a book. The rest of the food was put back into the earth so that the soil would be richer for people's flower gardens. Life for the townspeople was delicious until the weather took a turn for the worst. And there's a newspaper article and the title is Spaghetti Ties Up Town. One day there was nothing but gorgonzola cheese all day long. And the next day there was only broccoli and all of it was overcooked. The next day there were Brussels sprouts and peanut butter with mayonnaise. Another day, there was a pea soup fog. Nobody could see where they were going, and they could barely find the rest of the meal that got stuck in the fog. Getting some serious weather. The food was getting larger and larger, and so were the portions. The people were getting frightened. Violent storms blew up frequently, and awful things were happening. One Tuesday, there was a hurricane of bread rolls all day long and into the night. There were soft rolls and hard rolls, some with seeds and some without. There was white bread and rye and whole wheat toast. Most of it was larger than they had ever seen bread and rolls before. It was a terrible day. Everyone had to stay indoors. Roofs were damaged, and the sanitation department was beside itself. The mess took the workers four days to clean up, and the sea was full of floating rolls. To help out, the people piled up as much bread as they could in their backyards. The birds picked at it a bit, but it just stayed there and got staler and staler. There was a storm of pancakes one morning and a downpour of maple syrup that nearly flooded the town. A huge pancake covered the school. No one could get it off because of its weight, so they had to close the school. I wish our school was closed because of a giant pancake. Lunch one day brought 15 inch drifts of cream cheese and jelly sandwiches. Everyone ate themselves sick and the day ended with stomach aches. There was an awful salt and pepper wind accompanied by an even worse tomato tornado. People were sneezing themselves silly and running to avoid the tomatoes. The town was a mess. There were seeds and pulp everywhere. The sanitation department gave up. The job was too big. Everyone feared for their lives. They couldn't go outside most of the time. Many houses had been badly damaged by giant meatballs. Stores were boarded up and there was no more school for the children. So a decision was made to abandon the land of Chew and Swallow. It was a matter of survival. Look at that giant pickle. Ah, so scary. Started out so fun, not so fun anymore. The people glued together the giant pieces of stale bread, sandwich style with peanut butter, took the 
absolute necessities with them and set sail on their rafts for a new land. They had to make boats to get out of there. Thank goodness that bread was so big. After f being afloat for a week, they finally reached a small coastal town which welcomed them. The bread held up surprisingly well, well enough for them to build temporary houses for themselves out of it. The children began school again, and the adults all tried to find places for themselves in the new land. The biggest change they had to make was getting used to buying food at the supermarket. They found it odd that the food was kept on shelves, packaged in boxes, cans, and bottles. Meat that had to be cooked was kept in large refrigerators. Nothing came down from the sky except for rain and snow. The clouds above their heads were never made of fried eggs. No one ever got hit by a hamburger again. And nobody dared to go back to Chew and Swallow to find out what had happened to it. They were too afraid. Henry and I were awake until the very end of Grandpa's story. I remember his good night kiss. The next morning, we woke up to see snow falling outside our window. We ran downstairs for breakfast and ate it a little faster than usual so that we could go sledding with Grandpa. It's funny, but even when we were sliding down the hill, we thought we saw a giant pat of butter on the top, and we could almost smell the mashed potatoes. Can you see how it looks like mashed potatoes over here? <laughs> yum. Yum, yum, yum. And that, my friends, is the end. And we got a beautiful bowl of mashed potatoes. This made me hungry. I'm going to go eat lunch. You should too. I'll be back here tomorrow with another fun one. Bye. I love you.